Yeah, you can, you can start if you want, Luciana. Great. Well, hello, shallow Lakers. I'm so glad to stay here today of our first day of this grade. And why not? Uh, I'm Luciana, and I'd like to say thanks for coming. Well, I'd like to invite you to help me welcome Dr. Sofia. Dr. Sofia is a senior research fellow at the Center for Ecological Research Hungary, where she just recently started her own lab. She has previously worked at Vasa Cluster Lens in Austria, Center for, for Integrative Biodiversity Research, German, and KU Levin in Belgium, where she is still a guest researcher building an impressive network. She is particularly interested in spatial ecology and how communities are interconnected in landscape. Her studies have highlighted the importance of connectivity among habitats and the landscape as a basis for effective management tools and conservation. A significant part of her work focuses on crustacean zooplankton and saline temporary ponds by combining field data with experimental approaches. I'd like to highlight a small piece in the Sophie Laboratory webpage. I'm a community ecologist with a major interest in spatial ecology. I am the most excited about how invisible connectivity via dispersal between island-like habitats shapes biodiversity and community patterns. In my viewpoint, this is a small piece to reveal a, a great enthusiasm and a very nice perspective to meta communities and communities ecology. So thank you, Dr. Sophie, for your presence. Our screen is yours. Thanks, Luciana. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Just give me a mo. Um, yes, I'm here. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for the organizers. I am really enjoying this conference and um, the talk so far, they were wonderful. And um, I was also listening to the uh, early career workshops and they were just fantastic. So big thumbs up for all the organizers. It's it's really, a, it's a superb event. And um, I mean, for me, it's kind of as close as it can get to uh, an in-person meeting. And this is, yeah, this is what we have now. And I, I think you, you, you got like as much as you could uh, from this um, weird situation. So um, yeah, hello and welcome to, to everybody who is now uh, listening. Um, yeah, so I am now based at, um, or based in Hungary, but I mean, most of the work that actually is uh, coming in my presentation was basically done in, in, in Austria. So I also kind of added this um, older affiliation of mine in, um, yeah, on this, this front page. Um, yeah, and that, with that being said, let's let's talk a bit about connectivity and and uh, how it shapes biodiversity and how we can perhaps work a little bit um, on conserving it in the landscape. Um, well, we heard some really superb talks from 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 Anna, from Matthew, from from Pedro on um, uh, these kind of connectivity networks and how meta community ecology is advancing on on this forefront. And now I guess many of you know that um, this is many times done with these kind of uh, less traditional uh, islands that we work with. So um, like ponds and pools and um, rock pools, uh, even tree holes, um, but also with mesocosms or with microcosms, which can be even really, really, really tiny. Um, and in my talk now, uh, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about these kind of pondscapes and uh, what I'm bringing you is essentially three little stories about empirical um, connectivity studies and um, yeah how we can infer 
things to uh, biodiversity and regional biodiversity conservation from, from these studies. So, um, as you know, in a pondscape, um, this is kind of a collection of, of ponds in a landscape. We uh, can start with, you know, digging into the, the, the local um, interactions that we see, for example, within one pond. So they can be either biotic um, or biotic. So, for example, on the, on the abiotic gradient, um, species are responding to this abiotic gradient and um, at the same time it's, it's, it's not all that is happening within a pond, so of course there are some biotic interactions depending on what species came first or who is a, um, a better competitor. And at the same time, these ponds are not just a collection of ponds, but also there are some stuff um, happening in between the ponds. So this is this is the dispersal. This is uh, essentially the ecological connectivity between these ponds. And therefore, no pond is really an island because they are all connected in the landscape. Um, and this is essentially kind of the center part of my talk and how we can uh, handle it within pondscapes. So, um, yeah, a really important thing about these kind of pondscapes is that these ponds are usually not connected physically. So if you just look at them, it's a bit different from, for example, floodplains or like larger lakes where you have um, a really visible physical connection. So like streams coming in and out from your from your lakes or um, the floodplains being sometimes physically attached to the main um, rivers and I mean, this means that uh, we have to handle things a little bit differently in, in, in these kind of environments. So, um, yeah, first you could take it as a distance-based approach and you could say like, yeah, actually things are a bit easier to handle because I don't have to worry about like who is really um, connected through a stream to whom and how long this stream um, is actually um, between these two ponds or, or lakes. Um, so actually, this could be a little bit taken on the on the on the easy way. So we can say like, yeah, there's a probability of dispersal events that might uh, change with distance, and um, yeah, you can work with that. But perhaps it's not always a reliable tool, and um, in many cases it is. But in one of my stories, I will try to show you that it is worth to to think about other things as well. Um, and the second thing is that I think it's kind of a challenge that these uh, non-physical ecological connections between the ponds, they are invisible. So it's also really hard to argue for their conservation. So for example, if you just think about it and, com and, and compare it to like um, connectivity conservation on uh, flowing like rivers and, and uh, physically connected uh, landscapes, uh, it receives much less attention. So if you, if you think about uh, connectivity conservation in the aquatic realms. Everybody thinks about dams and 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 that we have to uh, think about how to get rid of dams and make make uh, rivers free flowing again. Um, but with ponds, it's 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 not so straightforward how you can actually conserve this kind of kind of connectivities. And um, um, yeah, I, I hope to enlighten some of these things in in, in my forthcoming talk. So, um, as I said, I will bring you three little stories. So first I would like to um, show how we can perhaps better understand these kind of invisible connections in the network and, and reveal that sometimes they are not so straightforward to, to uh, understand. And then I will show you how we can actually show the consequences of this connectivity loss on the long term and how it affects a pond network. And eventually I will, I will finish up my talk with um, a story about conserving networks um, as they are. So um, when we talk about, of course, the uh, connectivity between uh, these ponds, and then I said it's, most of a, it's mostly a distance-based approach because no matter if it's an actively dispersing organism or a passively dispersing organism, we, we immediately consider that uh, things are related to, you know, the dispersal kernel and it's a symmetric dispersal kernel. So actually, uh, the closer two ponds are in a landscape, the more likely that they are connected uh, through dispersal. So a frog will hop from one pond to the other more likely if they are uh, closer to each other. But I mean, my cheeky question is, is this, is this true in all cases? And um, just think about it. So like dispersal agents, they 
they might not know that they should behave like this. So for example, if you think about like um, water bird migration um, in the US, there are these, these, these really fantastic colorful pictures when you can uh, follow up the flyways of, of water birds um, migrating from the north to the, to the south. And um, there was, this is kind of one of my favorite examples for this that um, colleagues were, were doing a, a phylogenetic uh, study on Artemia, so brine shrimps. And what they found was that the genetic distances were much more related to these uh, whatever migration routes um, compared to just simply distance. So for example, if you see here, there are like um, two populations that essentially have no gene flow in between them, even though they are close. And at the same time, the water birds are connecting them to much more far away um, sites. So that's, I think, kind of a, uh, a fun thing to, to think about. Um, and also wind can be in some form similar to this because there are several regions where you um, don't have this kind of random uh, wind dispersal, but you have really strong unidirectional winds. So for example, if you are near the uh, shores of the ocean or a lake, um, yeah, you can, on, on these examples, you can even see it on, on the vegetation that there is definitely one direction that is much more dominant over the, the, uh, the others in, in, um, in the wind that uh, blows in these areas. And also if you are like in a continent, you can also find these kind of sites. So for example, near um, lakes or between large mountains. So like in the valleys or just simply a, a floodplain between two large mountains, you can find the same, um, same effects or you are supposed to find the same effects. And um, with that, I'm already zooming into our first study, which we did um, on this lowland area between uh, here's Austria, here's Hungary. So here's a little nice region that uh, we did a lot of work at. And um, well, this part, it's, it's essentially, it's a essentially uh, a plain that is situated between two high mountains. So first here you see the famous Alps and next to it, there is the high Tatras, which is an equally high mountain uh, part of, of Central Europe. And in between you have essentially uh, a wind tunnel. Um, so it can be fun to work at, at this place because sometimes it can be really a challenge to keep your uh, stuff together when you want to sample. Uh, this meta community that we usually work at. So this is uh, a wonderful, perfect meta community of um, some shallow uh, temporary saline habitats. Well, I am going to call them soda pans. If they were in the US, I guess they would be called playas. Um, so they are temporary, they dry out essentially every year, but at the same time, they are also saline. So it's, it's kind of a fun, um, meta community to work with and um, I'm mostly interested in, in zooplankton. So like the, the tiniest, let's imagine that these, these tiny dots are rotifers and then everybody is on this picture. So like rotifers, uh, copepods, these red guys, cladocerans and also anostracons, so fairy shrimps, they, they all live here and um, yeah, they will be the central study of, of all this that I'm going to tell you about. So what we did, um, we have this nice little Meta community, and uh, we went there and we wanted to um, essentially detect the role of this directional wind dispersal. And we were interested if we can find and, um, you know, explain more variation in the communities if we use this kind of uh, directional information based on, based on how the wind is usually blowing in the area compared to uh, a more traditional uh, distance based approach. So, what we did. Um, um, we essentially use this um, kind of synonym that essentially the same thing happens as when you have a flow direction in, in for example, a riverine meta community. Uh, you can connect all these sites according to, to that and then put it into a, a statistical model and then check if you can explain uh, more variation with this uh, directional model than as if compared to the non-directional one. Um, and yeah, we did this with this very, very uh, classic uh, variation partitioning uh, analysis that is like being used all the time in, in meta community analysis when we 
try to grab the information that we have in the community data and then we split it to what we can um, explain with the environmental variation versus the spatial variation. And what we did was that we used these kind of two alternative spatial information and in, in, in these models. And um, yeah, when we compared the results, we could see that with these symmetric methods, actually, there was like close to 20% of environmental variation explaining these communities, which makes sense. They are saline, they are turbid, they are really stressful environments. So of course, environment is, is a really um, important component of, of um, explaining the variation in the communities. Um, and it seemed that there is not much space to, to see in the data. Um, but at the same time, when we put in uh, the wind effect, we could see actually much more in the data. So uh, that was actually kind of surprising how big the spatial effect uh, became. So actually it was even more than the environmental effect. And at the same time, I mean, if you, if you look at it, the environmental data was still the same. So it was actually the unexplained variation that we, we could take out from, from this data and explain with this uh, directionality. Um, but then we didn't stop there, so we asked ourselves, like, maybe we were just somehow lucky, maybe also in the other directions there would be um, the same exponential power. So what we did, we went basically around the wind rows and then compared the wind direction distribution to the spatial variation that we can explain with these um, directions. And actually there was a really good agreement um, in between these two. And then eventually we also said like, okay, but we still don't know like what is actually happening in the meta community. So is it like a mass dispersal of, you know, from the upwind to the downwind sites and this is what we see in the data or perhaps there is a dispersal limitation that is getting better as you walk down the uh, wind tunnel. So for this, we, we, we took an approach um, where you can relate dispersal rate to the environmental match because theory predicts that if you have um, an intermediate dispersal rate, then you will have the most effective species sorting in a meta community. And this will lead to your best possible environmental match. So like when all the species can find their, their, their kind of favorite uh, habitat in the landscape. And if you have either less or more dispersal, then you will end up with um, less environmental match in the meta community or in, in the local communities. Um, and so we, we um, um, estimated this kind of environmental match, match or mismatch. And if we uh, projected it on the map or projected it according to the um, position over the given, given lake um, in this upwind downwind channel, we could actually see that uh, also this environmental match was explaining the same story so that when we are upwind, so here, these are the ponds that cannot really receive that much propagules as the ones that are downwind, they tend to show a bit worse environmental match than the others. So then eventually we could, um, yeah, deduct from, from all this that what we see actually here is a gradient of dispersal limitation that is getting lessened as you uh, go to the more downwind sites. Um, so from this story, my, my, my take home message for you is that perhaps keep your mind open, try to consider alternative ways um, of connectivity when you work in, in pond networks. Maybe it's not the most straightforward and the first thing to, to go for. Perhaps try these things, perhaps think about it. And for the applied scientific part, I mean, it can change the relative importance of individual habitats in a landscape. So if you have, for example, uh, a pond network and, um, and you have to make a choice, you have to make a decision, so for example, how to or where to restore a pond or, or, or where to uh, not restore a pond, yeah, your, your choice of these sites can really depend on this kind of uh, connectivity network that you work with. Um, and then my, my next story will be about um, actually how this connectivity um, is driving the biodiversity and what happens when we take it out from the system. So we will take the same landscape, the same pondscapes to a broader perspective and we're going to walk a little bit back in, in time and in this longitudinal study that I'm going to 
show you as, as, as my second story. Um, so I guess most of you know and, and have been faced with the problem that pond networks are shrinking worldwide. So uh, ponds, wetlands, we are losing them at a really, really high end and alarming rate. And in some regions, it's, it's up to 100% uh, percent of habitat loss. So it's like previous pondscapes are completely gone. And uh, in most cases, it's like 50, 60, 70, 80% of, of habitat loss. And, and it's really kind of happening, yeah, um, as we live and, and in our life and in our grandparents and parents' lives. So it's really the, the story of the 20th century. So for example, in this case uh, that I sh just show you, um, if I look at the pondscape now, and then I compare it to uh, the same picture from, from 60 years ago, um, I can see that there are a number of ponds that are gone. And actually in the, in the vegetation, you can still see it. So for example, perhaps the, the meadow is a bit wet here. So the vegetation is a bit different. You can, you can really see where, where they are gone from uh, in the landscape. And um, yeah, all in all, when we started to gather this information, we figured that actually 70% of the ponds that were there in the middle of the 20th century they are gone. They are now just wet patches of, of vegetation or perhaps a little temporary marsh, but, but no longer a pond or soda pan. Um, and so this network is also typical in that manner. So it happens all over the globe. Um, and yeah, my question is like, why, why, why is this? Why is this a problem? Why we should worry about this? I mean, first thing is that it's kind of straightforward. Of course, there's a direct uh, effect of the loss of habitats. If, if you lose a habitat, then you're losing all the species, all the special circumstances that um, were there in, in, in that local patch. Um, so that's kind of a direct loss and then, then, then we feel it kind of all of us. But at the same time, if we are thinking about the network in the network perspective, there is also an indirect effect. So with the fragmentation of this, this whole habitat network, um, we are also losing the connectivity. So actually this is, this is a burden for, for the remaining neighbors. So when a pond is falling out from here, then all the neighboring habitats could be also affected because they are simply uh, losing part of their spatial insurance in the landscape. Um, at the same time, it's, it's really, really difficult to, to understand these indirect effects. And uh, for example, in the terrestrial realm, I think people are a bit more further ahead because there are all these fantastic fragmentation experiments, you know, when they are working with these continuous landscapes of, of forests and um, yeah, they are trying to, to really grab this um, fragmentation and connectivity uh, loss effects on, on biodiversity. But with aquatic systems, it's, it's a bit harder and I think it's, it's lacking behind. And also even, even these terrestrial systems, actually a lot of the stuff is coming only from experiments or <clears throat> perhaps space for time substitutions where you have different sized uh, fragments in the landscape and then you try to relate it back to um, what could have been the species loss uh, compared to a more continuous landscape. And in several of these examples, there is a problem with, with the scaling, like how you compare these species richnesses and how you can actually make a, a good prediction for uh, species losses with connectivity loss. And um, yeah, all in all, there is not much evidence for, for direct evidence for these kind of connectivity losses, even though you have testable predictions. So for example, um, if we are, um, if we are looking at a, a species area relationship, um, yeah, of course, if we are losing habitats, then we are going to lose a number of species simply because of a so-called sampling effect that, that we are ending up with a smaller area or uh, less number of ponds. Um, but actually, if the connectivity network doesn't suffer from this, I am going to get exactly the same amount of species area relationship. And um, yeah, recently there is a lot of um, a lot of talk about this additional fragmentation effect and that we can actually detect this also from, from species area relationships. Because if we 
if we end up with a different relationship, then it's kind of a double effect of, of this, this habitat loss on the resulting connectivity of, of the habitat network. And um, with that being said, I'm going to show you how we could actually grab this in, in this pondscape that I'm, I'm talking about. So as I said, this landscape is no special. I mean, it's exactly like any other pondscape that is um, shrinking uh, in the world. There is just one thing that, that was um, special about it is that we have really good data here. So in the 50s, uh, there used to be more than 100 habitats. And even though we didn't have data from all of them, we could have, we could get data from 55. So like half of all the habitats that were there. And it was really good data. So we had um, seasonal data, we had environmental data, and it was really reliable. And then we matched it up, we, we took care of the taxonomical changes, and then we could match it with um, today's situation where we have only 30 habitats and we sampled all these, all these 30 habitats for uh, the same zooplankton communities. Um, so then we wanted to see if we can detect any effect of these connectivity, connectivity losses uh, on the biodiversity. Um, so when we put together the species, the species inventory of, of, um, of these two time points, uh, we could immediately see that we see less species, but just by looking at these numbers, it's, it's not telling you much because if you don't see it, that the scale is different, then, then you cannot really compare it. So we put it on the uh, species accumulation uh, curves to see actually what is going on. And then we could immediately see that there was some really big changes um, happening from uh, the 50s to today's situation. So if we look at the original species accumulation curve, and from that, we want to um, um, kind of project like how many species we are supposed to lose if we go down to only 30 habitats that are there today. Uh, this expected loss would be four species. So from the 64, we would go down to 60. It's not, not a big deal. Um, but actually the reality was that we lost 17 species in the region, at least 17 species in the, in the uh, region. So that's, that's, that's a really big difference. Um, so here we could already see that there is something, something bad going on with, with connectivity. Um, and then we, we dig a little bit deeper into this story. And actually we were also interested in, in which species um, <clears throat> were lost in, in, in this um, pondscape. <coughs> and there we included some, some traits from, from um, the zooplankton species. So we checked uh, how many ponds they used to occupy. So like how well spread they were in the region, what were the habitat preference according to salinity, what were their body size and so on. Um, and we could see that what really mattered and the only, actually the only significant uh, effect was this, this original habitat occupancy. So if you look at this scale, so like how many of these habitats a given species was uh, occupying in the 50s, so each of these dots is now one species. Actually, those that went extinct in these 60 years are all of, are, are, were all uh, rare in the original uh, network. So, those species that were in at least 30% of the original habitats, they are all there today. So actually this was kind of like affecting the, the rare species. So again, this is something that is um, immediately referring to meta-community dynamics. Um, and then we were also interested in what happens locally and uh, if the remaining habitats also lose species, or at least the alpha diversity is not affected only the, the regional species pool. But we could see that there was a significant loss also in, in local diversity. So on average, we have three species, three zooplankton species less per habitat um, today as compared to the mid 20th century. Um, and yeah, someone could come up with like, yeah, maybe the environment was changing and there were some other changes that, that happened in the meantime and that has led to this and it's, it's still not connectivity. So we, we did a final analysis uh, where we wanted to separate these things. And um, what we found was that it was not the, not the change in area, not the change in, in salinity, which is kind of the most important environmental factor. 
uh, for these ponds, but it was clearly connectivity loss of a given um, site in the landscape. So what we did, um, we made um, um, a network model where we um, calculated the, the centrality index for each of the ponds in the 50s, and then we redid this for the uh, new network that we see now in the landscape and then standardize this change and then compare like how much connectivity actually one um, habitat has lost in the meantime. Um, and we could really relate this to the um, species loss that they suffered. So like the alpha richness that uh, is gone from, from a, a local habitat, it is really clearly linked to um, the connectivity loss of a given uh, habitat. So all in all, this 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 all are like pointing to the direction of the connectivity loss, and that the connectivity loss is the main um, driver of these of these species losses in this landscape. So eventually, the more neighbors uh, uh, a surviving pond has lost, the more species it has lost. So this is this is really um, a, a strong uh, result, I think, or like a strong message that it's essentially that um, the species loss is, is, is linked to the disruption of this habitat network, this connectivity, and there even the remaining habitats suffer, even if you are conserving it in the best possible conservation uh, state, so it's, it's still the same salinity, it's not eutrophied, I don't know, it's not over-vegetated, still it will suffer because it's losing its, its, its neighbors in the, in the landscape, so it's kind of a double negative effect that, that uh, we found. Um, and then not to end up my talk with this kind of negative message, I'm, um, I'm bringing you the third story about the protection of, of these surviving pond networks. So um, as I said, it's, it's a global problem. So it's, it's happening worldwide. So here in, in, in Austria, we could see how it happened, but it's the same, like this is a, a study from Morocco that I found that was very similar, um, even on the <coughs> time scale, even on the habitat loss scale. Also in the UK, they have uh, really similar problems and I guess it's, it's really, really worldwide. So at the same time, we have to think about that we should protect these surviving pond networks and perhaps some of them are artificial, um, Perhaps some of them are intentional or not intentionally created. There was this really nice talk I, I, I listened to from Beate Ortli on, on um, these in, intentional uh, new like reservoirs and, and, and artificial water bodies and how they can host biodiversity in the landscape. But sometimes they are non-intentional and I'm bringing you uh, this kind of, I don't know, let's call it weird, uh, pondscape that we are working with is this pond, bomb crater pond networks and um, it's kind of a typical habitat in in Hungary it's it's a bit of a weird situation so um, coming from World War II and then yeah military activities afterwards actually Hungary has really big landscapes with with these kind of um, bomb craters but uh, in many of these landscapes, um, actually, they are not welcome. So uh, there are some reconstruction works where they are filling them uh, up and really are, yeah, removing them from the landscape. And of course, I mean, I mean, yeah, let's let's face it. Let's be let's be honest. Of course, it's it's necessary. So sometimes you still have these um, bombs um, sitting in the in the grassland and just waiting to. Uh, blow up. So yeah, they can also leak a lot of um, nasty stuff to to these ponds. Of course, they yeah they have to get rid of these. It's it's kind of absolutely understandable. But what I'm missing in in many cases, nobody is talking about what is happening to the biodiversity. It's kind of like biodiversity is is non-existent. They are just you know scars in 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 the landscape that were created by these wartime activities. And so um, we wanted to kind of find a showcase for this and then find and um, find proof for, for, the, um, for the fact that these ponds can actually operate as a really nice natural pondscape in, in, uh, in these grasslands. And perhaps they are uh, worthy of considering for conservation. And uh, for this, we 
um, chose a, a network of pond, bo, uh, ponds that consist of a bit more than 50 large ponds. So you have, you might have seen uh, these ponds in Luc de Messe's talk uh, yesterday because we have uh, done now an experiment um, in exactly the same landscape. So also on these pictures, sometimes you can see our mesocosms in, in the ponds. Um, but this study is still before that, so we, we went there and we just wanted to prove that they are uh, worthy of conservation. So uh, we went there, we um, essentially sampled all the biota that we could get. So from, um, from bacteria to vertebrates, we, we collected data from, from everything. And we really wanted to prove that if you do a grassland restoration and you fill up like, I don't know, a different a share of these ponds, then, then, then it's really not good for biodiversity. Um, so yeah, we, we, we put together these um, species inventories and um, then we, as a first step, we compared it to, for example, natural reference habitats, because these are, again, saline ponds, so they are temporary, they are saline, they are shallow, so in many cases they are actually very similar to the soda pans that I just showed before, so in, in, in Austria, and these soda pans, they occur in Austria and Hungary and Serbia, and we know a lot about their biota. And actually, when we compare this tiny, tiny network of, of ponds here, so we are talking about, like, I don't know, 500 meters as a spatial scale, um, the species inventories were really largely overlapping with, with what you find on a much larger scale in like, yeah, on, on the whole Vanonian plain in, in, in these solar plants. So that was, that was kind of a, a surprising thing even for, for us. And then we zoomed in to the, um, to the better diversity patterns in, in, the major, in, in the major groups. So we had like diatom, zooplankton, and macroinvertebrates that were really uh, species rich. And there we uh, wanted to see how the better diversity is um, actually assembled. So is it rather the richness difference because of the salinity gradients or is it species replacement? And what we found was that it was mostly species replacement. So that means that it's kind of the, the essence of, of um, better diversity. So this is, this is what we want to see in a, a really diverse network. So like you have um, all these differences between the ponds, which is not coming from, um, for example, less species along the salinity gradient, but really like different species inhabiting different ponds. And um, when we projected it to the map, we could see that um, essentially it was really like nicely scattered around. So the local contribution of each pond to this replacement component was, was really like um, scattered and there was no big spatial differences. And also for the different groups, it was explained by different environmental predictors. So like zooplankton responded more to, for example, salinity, macroinvertebrates to, I don't know, vegetation cover. So eventually what we could infer from this, that this is what is driving better diversity. And this is what is actually explaining this kind of biodiversity hotspot situation here that we have all these different ponds, all these different environmental uh, habitats offered in a really tiny landscape. And, and this is really good for biodiversity. And um, yeah, for the managers, it might be looked at like, oh, they are all the same. So they are just, you know, concrete ponds. They are absolutely nothing interesting. But for us, we, we immediately see the gradients. I mean, you can see the gradient from a more temporary to a more permanent site, you can see that there are some which are more um, vegetated and some that have no micro vegetation at all. And um, yeah, all in all, it's really kind of a, a diverse, really nice little landscape that is, is, is worth protected. And um, because of the fact that we, we had this um, early career workshop also about communication, I would like to kind of finish up my, my talk um, with a not so scientific story. So like how important it is to communicate this stuff to, to the stakeholders. Um, because for us, what happened here is that, yeah, we published this paper and um, yeah, we are not applied scientists. So we, we can of course put it into writing. We can of course argue for the conservation, but we are kind of, yeah, limited with, with tools. Um, 
But then what we did was that we uh, sent the uh, resulting paper to the national park and we accompanied it with a couple of sentences like without any scientific jargon like, yeah, this is what we found. Thank you for giving us the permit to work here. This is our major finding, blah, blah, blah. And as far as I recall, they didn't even reply. So we thought like, yeah, yeah, whatever, at least we tried. Um, but then later on, we, we heard them actually speaking on the media and uh, the National Park was kind of talking about a paper and they were saying like how important these pondscapes are and they want to conserve it and they will give all the effort to conserve it in, in, in this um, particular region. And um, <coughs> it was really fun that in 2019, we, we went back to, to this pondscape because this is when we started to work on this um, experimental study together with Luke. And we could see that there were a lot of earthworks um, being done in the, in the region because there are a lot of ditches around. It used to be rice fields um, in this region. And um, yeah, we, we got a little bit worried about the ponds, but then it was really nice to see that actually even when, when um, a pond was really close to these ditches, uh, for example, here, you can see a pond uh, it was conserved, so you can see that the um, excavators, they just, they just went around it. And yeah, also in the landscape, you could see it like this. And it was really fun because when we, when we went out and we were doing our experiment here, um, the local rangers came and visited us, you know, talked to us what we are actually doing. And, and he, the local ranger, started to talk about that they know how important these ponds in the landscape are and that he himself was here and told the excavation uh, workers that they have to go around the pond and they have to conserve it and no pond should be uh, lost in this landscape during the, the earthwork, which is kind of kind of a really nice vibe to you, you know? So this is, this is why I'm, I'm saying like, you have to think about it, how you can communicate um, your results. And I'm especially telling this to the um, early career uh, scientists that are now now listening because it's like, for example, we had a simple message here that the network needs to be protected, but then we could also communicate it and actually this is now being done. So um, yeah, this is why I decided to end up my, my, my talk with this kind of, you know, positive example. Um, so to, to wrap it up and give you my conclusions for, for Pondscape conservation. So um, Essentially, a good understanding of connections in a, in a pond network is, is, of course, really crucial. And sometimes it's not the connection that you might first think about. Um, and to understand the consequences of the connectivity loss that we are now facing in, in many pondscapes, we need more empirical data and we need good data. And perhaps you have these data, you just never really thought about it, that you could actually relate it to, to the changes in your network. So. Um, yeah, perhaps this is this is giving you some some ideas to to do so, and yeah, finally, um, we can work uh, towards conserving networks with the toolkit of meta community ecology. So when we look at it from the connectivity point of view and conserving meta diversity, conserving connectivities, and we communicate this, then actually we can we can work for for conserving these these networks. So with that uh, all being said, I would like to uh, thank my, my colleagues who did a major share in, in putting this all into, into writing and uh, especially my co-authors. And um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Sof Sofia. Sorry, I cannot pronounce in the Hungarian way. Uh, uh, for the wonderful talk, okay. I would like to, to invite uh, people to ask questions to, to Sophie uh, through the question and answer option of the Zoom. Let me see, there are already four. Uh, Sophie, the first question is from Nestor from the Saras Institute in Uruguay. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. In the case of the ponds created by bombs during the Second World War, it is surely distributed, especially based on infrastructure such as roads, train tracks, factories. How much of this original infrastructure, destroyed or currently existing, 
uh, how much of these original infrastructure conditions the current connectivity? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if the if if I understood it well, like the original. Uh, Nestor, wonder how much the infrastructure, the original infrastructure, uh, determines the the current connectivity. Um, I think here not so much. So, for example, here the bombing was actually targeting uh, an airport that is not even like here, here, but like, I don't know, like 50 kilometers away. Uh, I guess they didn't really find it. It was dark or I don't know. There are all these local stories. If you go to a pub, you can, you can hear about like how it actually uh, happened. But in, in this case, it's, it's really like in the middle of a grassland. So there is no major infrastructure there. So it was really just, um, they, they completely missed the, the original point that they, they wanted to bomb. So here, this is really like just a pondscape in the middle of a, of a grassland. And a question uh, from Steve, very interesting one. Are these bomb craters not going to fill due to natural succession in the vegetation? How to deal with that on the long term? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. That's uh, that's a very good one. Um, honestly, that's really difficult. So I, I I I don't know. I mean, at some point, I guess they should they should do something about it. So, for example, if you if you walk in this um, landscape, you can immediately see that there were also like smaller ponds, perhaps they were smaller bombs. I don't know, I'm not a war expert, but you can really see that there are some smaller ones that are already much more filled up. So also the diameter is, is smaller and also the uh, hydro period is also shorter. So on the long term, I guess it is, is it is definitely a challenge to to keep these keep these ponds there. So um, yeah, at some point, I guess the national park should do something. So like dig out some some sediment, take care of the vegetation before they all before they all fill up. Um, yeah, but we have to think about it if we want to do some, you know, paleolimnology or whatever we 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 might want to use these ponds for before they they start to uh, infer, inf uh, interfere with the uh, sediment of these ponds. But it's uh, whew, it's definitely a challenge. All right, uh, now a question from your good old friend, Luke, the master. Thanks very much, Sophia, for your very interesting and important talk. Conserving pond networks must be the future. I wondered that it would be great to use your ecology, uh, ecology letter approach for comparisons, for instance, across Europe. Do you have ideas on how to cope with intrinsic differences in species richnesses among regions. Can you contemplate on this? Thanks, Luke. That's, that's, uh, that's a really, really interesting thought, actually. Um, I guess these intrinsic differences would not be a problem if we had like long-term data. So once you have the kind of the, the time zero comparison to your current um, network and current biodiversity, then, then it's no longer really a, a problem because then you know how to, to compare it to or what to compare it to. But at the same time, I guess the main problem is that we don't have these kind of data. So um, yeah, for instance, that would be kind of a way to go if people went there to these networks and then like with paleolimnological data, we could actually go back and then compare the original biodiversity to what we have there in, in those regions. And then we could kind of um, follow these things over time. Um, but without really these kind of long-term reference data, you cannot really see these effects actually. And that's that's the main problem. So yeah, I guess if, if we can dig out some more data sets like this one that I, I, I found, it was kind of, you know, it was a little bit of a hidden data set. It was in German. We had to um, really make sure that it is comparable to um, the species list that we are using today. But with a little bit of work, we could we could do this actually. So, I I kind of believe that this would be this would be possible to achieve in in, in other regions as well. So, I kind of have a feeling that these kind of data sets are actually lying there somewhere. But if not, perhaps with paleolimnology. 
All right. So now a question from Sumita uh, or Sumita. Uh, people, I'm sorry if I, 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 I pronounce wrong uh, your names. Okay. Uh, thank you very, very much for the fascinating presentation. For ponds, lakes with reducing connectivity, is it possible that the sampling equipments used for collecting the biota from different ponds could possibly act as dispersal medium for a species present? Yeah, sure. I mean, there are some 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 papers about um, how these kind of sampling gears are also like people's boots and um, the tires of cars that can act as as dispersal agents. It's not just in in um, ponds with with uh, like under connectivity loss, but like all sorts of, of ponds and lakes. It's it is it is definitely definitely a fact. And a question now from Matthild uh, from Germany. Uh, thanks for this beautiful talk. Do you know anything on the mechanisms of the biodiversity loss? Uh, for instance, genetic analysis showing increased genetic distances um, or indirect effects such as loss in biodiversity in birds. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm contemplating on it. Well, I guess what what is is really happening is that it's simply the the loss in the in the numbers and the loss in the on, in 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 the neighbors because it's like I don't know loss in diversity in birds. I guess it's not really really happening because they have uh, really long term data sets and the birders in, in the area, they are not really complaining about this. At least they, they don't see it much happening. So I guess it's, it's really these kind of short-term uh, dispersal effects that, that we are now uh, running out of. So these kind of you know, regular dispersal events that would happen between sites that are just you know, a few hundreds or perhaps one or two kilometers away from each other um, and it's simply a matter of, you know, it's, it's a chance effect simply. So um, if you have less ponds nearby, then you have less chances to, to, to get there either by, you know, on the boots of a researcher or a cattle or, um, I don't know, like legs of a, fro a fox that is just drinking from one to the other or on, on birds also. Um, but what I, I, I really see in the data is, is simply this, that, that it's the loss of the neighbors that is, that is terrible for the biodiversity. All right, and now a question from Rosenberg Menezes. Hi, Sophia. Thanks for your lovely and inspiring lecture. As you were already presented, connectivity loss is utterly the most important factor explaining species loss. I am convinced with this. However, dispersal assembled communities are expected to have considerable site-to-site -site variation in their community composition among uh, similar environments. So what's the importance of a species sorting to explain those differences between time in your study? Well, we did not directly follow up on the strength of, of species sorting. I think that would be actually um, something to do. So there was an analysis that, that I did, but then we didn't include it in, in the manuscript eventually, that for example, species richness and its relation to uh, salinity in, in, in the landscape, we could compare it for eventually in, in zooplankton, in, in some taxa, we even had um, data from the 80s. So we could compare like how salinity is related to species richness in the 50s, in the 80s and today. And what I could see is that there was kind of a flattening relationship. So that was also really interesting. So like, like the environment is explaining perhaps less um, in the data now that, that uh, the dispersal limitation is increasing. So actually that, that, would be, that would be a cool thing to do. So like um, going back and then, then using a meta community approach and then comparing the meta community before and then, then after the connectivity and uh, yeah, compare it like how the species sorting is changing because I guess the species sorting is actually getting worse. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. 
Okay, uh, the next question from Alan Law. Uh, great talk. Have you considered how other freshwater habitats, lakes, wetlands, rivers, influence connectivity in your experiments? Uh, thanks. Um, well, in, in, in our case, we, we really have kind of, we are in a lucky situation that um, these kind of networks, we can, we can really, you know, find it like where, where the network kind of ends. Of course, it doesn't end because then you might have other freshwater habitats, but these saline habitats, we are always uh, working with like the entire saline uh, meta community that we find in that in that uh, regional set. So in that sense, I think not that much. But for example, in um, in my Austrian uh, soda pans, they are next to the really big lake Lake Neusiedl, and at some point we were also contemplating on this, like how this might happen to influence our uh, species pool in the soda pans. And then we did some comparisons. And then what we found was that actually the species pool is not so much overlapping. So um, there are a lot of species that are in the lake, but you never find them in, in the soda pans. So, um, so I guess short, I mean, that there can be, there can be definitely some, some occasional species arriving some from, from the other more freshwater habitats around here, but I think the majority of the effects are not really coming from, from, from these. A question from Hayani Vanderlei, a former student of us that are in Hungary right now. Thank, thank you for the enlightened talk. Do you have date for the phytoplankton in these bombs uh, ponds? It would be nice to compare if the same pattern happens for phytoplankton. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I, have, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> that means thanks, yeah. Ah, all right. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, we also <laughs> tried to collect phytoplankton from these bomb craters, but then eventually we could not do much with them because they are super turbid. So it was really a nuisance to, to analyze these um, Sample. So eventually we did not go for uh, phytoplankton data, but what we do have at hand is that we now have um, a set of eDNA uh, samples ready. So during our samplings, we, we also collected um, DNA samples from, from the microbial realm. So we are soon going to dig a little bit more into this and there will be some more um, centrality and, and mass community stuff uh, that we want to do actually on on this microbial uh, level too. So that includes phytoplankton. A question from Anna Bortagaray. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoy it. Connectivity refers to closeness centrality, right? Did you try other metrics of centrality in the work of ecology letters or see the change in the distribution of roles associated with their centrality between the 50s and the 2010? Maybe the change in some network or pound metric could be used as an early sign to conservation strategies. Thanks, Anna. That's, that's a really, really good suggestion, actually, kind of, yeah, using this as an indicator. That's, that's, a, that's a lovely suggestion. Um, and you're right, it was closeness centrality that, that we used. Um, actually, I tried most of the metrics also. So they were they were using, they were basically showing the same thing. So there was there was not really major differences. I went for closeness centrality because for me it's kind of the most straightforward um, thing to understand these kind of positional changes in the landscape, and it's kind of kind of the easiest to 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 grab, but um, we definitely tried um, some of the other metrics as well, but they essentially they all, all show the, the same. Uh, a question from Joy Allen. Thank you for this great talk. Do you think there is some trade-off to do between promoting connectivity and the risk of having invasive species invading the pondscape? Yeah, interesting talk, thank you. Um, 
Mm, sure. I mean, if you have a higher level of connectivity, then yeah, it's a higher level of connectivity for all. Um, at the same time, if you have a much more saturated com uh, community, so for example, if a local community is really well connected in, in, um, in that particular pondscape, it is supposed to uh, be able to resist the invasion of new species a bit better. So essentially what I think is that it's kind of the opposite in, 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 um, in the end. So actually better connected communities should be able to withstand invasive species. Uh, a bit better. And now a question from Mariana Mehoff from Uruguay. Many thanks for the great talk. It is striking that in 60 years, bomb pounds started from zero but reached similar values of richness than the natural soda pounds today. Doesn't that suggest that could recover from the connectivity loss given the time? to just they could recover from the connectivity loss given the time. Mm, thanks, that's an interesting idea. Well, I guess recovering from connectivity loss, I honestly, I cannot really imagine this without increasing the connectivity. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the connectivity is, is, is lost, then you have already lost all these, all these species in, in the region, for example. It's not just the, the local richness, but also like the regional species pool has, has shrunk considerably. And um, what I honestly think is that with this amount of connectivity in that particular landscape that I was showing, I don't think that they will like recover without increasing their connectivity. Uh, a question now from uh, Carlos Iglesias from Uruguay as well. Sophie, thanks for your nice talk. How far was the matrix where these pounds are inserted modified? Do you think this eventually modified matrix might have affected the observed biodiversity loss pattern you show you shown? Mm, good question. Thanks. Um... Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, this is something that we could do. I mean, I mean, we are also uh, planning to do some more biodiversity and connectivity stuff in, in, in that region. So I guess sooner or later we will actually either directly or indirectly see this, how, uh, how this went on. But that's definitely something to, to keep in mind. Thanks. And a final question, Sophie, uh, from Glenn Cooper. Uh, I think he started to write the question, then by mistake, send it, and then he, he complete. He, he, so I will take the second one. But in the last example, do you think do you think filling in the ditches will have an impact on the connectivity of the ponds, and so their resilience and and, and diversity? Uh, in a case made for protecting these as well, although artificial, and ideally would be wetlands. P.S. Also, are the ponds themselves protected in any way, nationally, as a SAC or Hamsar site? Did you got uh, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's a whew, it's a complex question. Well, um, sure. I mean, because they feel that these these ditches actually they were also temporary temporary ditches, so obviously we are. Again, like losing some losing some uh, habitat area in, in in the landscape, so that is is definitely something to think about. Um, about protecting the the ponds, I mean, officially they are in the core area of the national park, so they are in in a protected landscape. It was kind of rather a, a difference in in the mindset of, of of the the national park if they want to conserve them or if they kind of see the grassland as kind of the priority to conserve and then in the grassland there is no need for for ponds. Um, so I guess this pond network that we are working now it is definitely going to be um, conserved on, on, on the long term because the National Park sees them now as, as an important um, hotspot and uh, anyway it is in the core area of the National Park so if the National Parks want, wants to conserve them, them I think they will stay there. 
All right. Thanks very much, Sophie, for your wonderful talk and for very stimulating discussions. Uh, since we are a bit ahead from our schedule, I would like to show you today a little bit of samba, perhaps the most popular.